slaves were cheap at five sterling, while African slaves were regarded as expensive at 50 sterling. Killing an Irish slave was of little concern compared to killing an expensive African slave. The interbreeding of Irish slave women with African slave men became so common that legislation was passed to halt it because the slave trade was suffering due to the slave master's ability now to create his own slaves. U.S. history books promote the notion that the Irish were merely indentured servants. But recent research has uncovered the real conditions endured by the Irish-American ancestors of 11.9% of the U.S. population. Add that to the 14.1% of the U.S. population with African-American ancestors, and now at least a quarter of the U.S. population deserves reparations. Or we could just let go of the illusion that we are a nation separated by race and realize we're a nation of mutts and immigrants. Focus our energy and address the current fact that 21 million adults and children are bought and sold worldwide and thrown into commercial sexual servitude, forced and bonded labor. John Baum for Infowars.com. Self-proclaimed hood billionaire Rick Ross dropped his seventh studio album today. I'm your neighborhood drug dealer. Drug dealer. It's your neighborhood drug dealer. Now, the Rick Ross of 2014 is a little bit more known for his recent weight loss and fondness for pears, yet he still feels that he's got to keep up this image of being the friendly neighborhood drug dealer. Now, why is this? Does he really think that his fans won't appreciate an album about mm, the miracles of a good juice cleanse? I eat pears now and shit like that. Shout out to all the pear. Of course not. And that is the hip hop psyop. How else will the establishment prime the youth for a life that leads to prison without selling them on the gangster lifestyle? The rapper Rick Ross is nothing but a soldier for the new world order. He is priming the youth for a life in prison, and he's laughing all the way to the bank. Here is what the real Rick Ross has to say to this name-jacking rapper. To William Roberts, a.k.a. Rick Ross, who's using my name, I'm inviting you in to come with me. Let's fight this culture. Let's fight this penitentiary culture that hip-hop's been spreading. Let's make a difference. But so many of our friends who look up to you and look up to me are out on the streets thinking that they can go out and sell drugs and parlay that into a record career. I don't know if you know that they're not going to make it, but I know that they're going to wind up in prison with prison sentences three and four times what they should be because this war on drugs is no joke. And I think that that's a false message to be given people to who feel hopeless and notice they don't indict the people that are fake and claim all that no no they want them out there like a lantern fish has that light to get the little fish to swim over so they can eat them have you ever thought to yourself why is this person so popular their music sucks well we all know that the music industry is a machine a giant machine 90 percent of what americans read watch and listen to is controlled by just six media corporations those media companies own and control all of the channels through which an artist becomes popular they own the networks the radio stations the award shows the movie studios the magazines the cable channels without any regard to their actual talent a person can be launched into superstardom overnight and here's another shocking truth the people who own all of the media are the same people who own all of the private prisons the prison industrial complex is a booming industry and just like any industry that needs a constant supply of raw materials to keep up with demand prisons need prisoners raprehab.com has done some really great legwork exposing the facts about hip-hop and prison for profit According to public analysis from Bloomberg, the largest holder in Corrections Corporation of America is Vanguard Group, Inc. Vanguard is the third largest holder in both Viacom and Time Warner. 
Vanguard is also the third largest holder in the GEO Group, whose correctional, detention, and community reentry services boast 101 facilities, approximately 73,000 beds, and 18,000 employees. Now, the number one holder of both Viacom and Time Warner is a company called BlackRock. BlackRock is the second largest holder in Corrections Corporations of America, second only to Vanguard, and the sixth largest holder in the GEO Group. Not so fast, Leanne. A reduction in crime would harm the bottom line. The prison industrial complex, of which I am a proud investor, depends on incarceration to make profits. We gotta keep all drugs illegal, make our prison sentences longer, and promote more gangster rap. And I will have more money in my bags. <laughs> so let me say that again. The people who own the media are also the same exact people who own the private prisons. Now these people are using hip hop to generate a constant stream of new inmates to keep business booming. These are the real hood billionaires. Now prior to the 1980s, private prisons did not exist in the US. But thanks to the war on drugs as implemented by the Reagan administration, incarceration rates skyrocketed. The demand for more prison space resulted in privatization and the for-profit prison industry. In 2012, the biggest name in the private prison industry offered to buy up the prisons in 48 states. One curious stipulation, states would have to guarantee a sufficient inmate population to maintain a minimum 90% occupancy rate over the term of the contract. Oh, but how could states possibly guarantee a minimum 90% occupancy rate? Well, enforcing mandatory minimums was one great start, but then there's the Kids for Cash scandal in which two judges in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania were receiving judicial kickbacks for sending youths convicted of minor crimes to a privatized for-profit juvenile facility. So legislation that's favorable to the industry is one great way to keep incarceration rates up, but so is the glamorization of the gangster lifestyle. It's absolutely essential as a continued advertisement for imprisonment. Now you see many artists with an empowering message just fall off and you're actually brainwashed to believe that this music is somehow inferior because it's not thug life. The music that gets pushed is that which breaks down the community and guarantees a 90% prison occupancy rate. And that is not my opinion. That is a pipeline to prison fact. It is no coincidence that the very same people who are disproportionately incarcerated are being inundated on a daily basis with this message that jail is just an ordinary and even expected fact of life. Yeah, it's very important that I redeem myself for the wrongs that I've done. And I feel that the way that I can redeem myself the best is by helping others not fall in the same footsteps that I fell in. Because I believe that it's a trap. It's a trap to catch you. Yeah. Just because you're doing bad and you're looking for a way to make an income, there's people that will take your freedom forever and ever. Don't make the same mistake I made. Don't get caught up. It's time for us to wake up and face it. Get the truth. And you're done. Welcome back to this live edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. Now going on to hour number four. And things are starting to heat up. In Ferguson, Missouri, I'm David Knight with Leanne McAdoo, and we have our reporters, Joe Jackson, uh, Joe Jackson, <laughs> Joe Hick, and Jakar Jackson. It's been four hours, folks, and we're here live. And so we're going to go back to see what's happening. They're right outside the uh, uh, the area there where they've been uh, protesting close to the police department. Let's go back to uh, Joe Biggs. Joe? Um, right now, there is some of the... Uh, 
more militarized looking police officers they are getting out of the back of the vehicle because they're trying to back up uh, no one's been listening to them so they're now forced to get out of the vehicle push the uh the reporters and or protesters out of the road so they're allowed to back their vehicle up there's a standoff going on once again with the uh with the police officers uh they have pushed their line up towards where the protesters are and it's uh essentially just another standoff again right now that's pretty much all we've been seeing tonight it seems like they've been given orders to sh show massive amounts of restraint. And oh well, well, last night, if you guys were able to catch the uh, the press uh, conference at around 2 a.m., they said they were treating this now on, from now on like they would a festival or a uh, football game in the town where they stand back and they, they really don't bother the crowds too much. So that's the mentality that they're trying to go with now. Stand back and just almost let the people govern themselves in a sense. Yeah. And you can see how things haven't escalated like they did initially when they were pointing guns at them and shooting them with rubber bullets and... They're not shouting at you yeah. in terms of uh, telling you to get into some kind of a free speech zone anymore, right? Not in this area. Uh, no, they're just trying to make sure everyone is on the sidewalk right now because, uh, like I said, I believe some of these vehicles are trying to back them up and move them into a different position right now. <sighs> See, and this guy here is just, you know, <laughs> yelling at the guy. The guy's not even t doing anything to him, and he's just <laughs> cursing at him, so... I don't know. There's one police helicopter that's pretty low, and there's a lot of uh, news helicopters. I'd say, well, not a lot, but three that are uh, way up overhead. You can see the, the sparkles of the lights, right? They're way up high. Mm -hmm. So far, like I said, I mean, everything overall has been pretty uh, pretty peaceful in a sense. You know, they shot gas a little bit earlier when we were at the city hall, but, you know, hey, there was a cop car on fire. Right. Yeah, I guess as, as far as we've seen, we've seen uh, that one incident to recap things. Uh, we saw that police car that was uh, set on fire and uh, tipped, uh, and then the police showed up and started telling people, they started shooting tear gas, right? Told everybody to uh, clear out of the area. But other than that, we've just seen the what apparently was a false alarm at a Walgreens. They all turned up, surrounded it, but nobody went in. It looked like the area was not breached. Yeah. So that's interesting, treating it like a festival. Um, yeah, I mean, that, those were exact words. I mean, they, you know, they said that they were disappointed in how everything turned out. They said that mm -hmm. they had had a discussion uh, around 30 minutes prior. They were in Clayton and they were heading back into this area. And uh, I can't remember the uh, the police department uh, chief's name, <laughs> but I, I'll never forget Captain Johnson. And he said that those two were talking and they said they really thought that everything was just going to turn out and, you know, be fine no problems at all and you know that two uh two o'clock in the morning press release you could just tell that everyone was really disappointed in how everything turned out and they just really wish that a lot of these outsiders wouldn't have come in and burned down their uh their home right because i mean even just some of the footage that you saw from last night people were just casually smashing windows with the bat just smashing a window oh, oh i missed a spot let me just get that window and i mean that doesn't do anything so that i mean that's not coming from ferguson rage that's someone that came in there to just v vandalize a town that wasn't their own but of course they could uh, use the cover of the announcement and the uh, anger of people they could use that because that announcement was made after dark uh, right. I, I really do believe things would have been much, much different. Uh, they would have been more reluctant to uh, get involved in looting, I think, in broad daylight than they would be after dark. Uh, I think it would have given them some time to do it. But I, I, I feel, going back even farther, I just feel like it was uh, a terrible mistake to uh, handle this grand jury investigation the way it was. They, they needed they, to they, vindicate the system, and they didn't do it. They just created more distrust. Mm -hmm. they, they've had three months to prepare for the situation. Yes. And then they, they're like, all right, well, let's release it at nighttime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, and if it was a matter of getting the schools emptied and the businesses emptied, then give, give a 24-hour warning and cancel school, you know, and then wait until the morning when it's daylight out, when there is no cover for you to go and loot and, and commit crime. 
You know, in the Army, after you, you something happens, you do what's called an after-action review. You know, you sit back, you discuss the uh, the things that went right, the things that went wrong, and you would think that the, the, the police force would have implemented some kind of uh, uh, rating system like that, so to say, but, you know, like... Based on what had happened in August, right, for example. This is what happened in August. Yeah. These are the mistakes we made. All right, this is what we need to do to correct them. <clears throat> yes. They, they, well, they, they should have sat down and had meeting and implemented